Mr. Stephen, uh, I've decided uh, that I don't like this sermon series. And I don't like it because it's about grace, and I find that the illustrations that I have to use all talk about me receiving grace, which means I have to talk about things I'm not good at. So I've just decided I don't like the sermon series. I'm just kidding. I, I'm very excited about this week, but I do have to talk about something else I'm not good at, which is gardening. I'm not good at gardening. And I'm not talking about like fruits and vegetables gardening. I'm talking about the aesthetic gardening. We have like flower beds and, and shrubbery around your houses, uh, that kind of gardening. We have red fetinias in front of our house and praise God that those things are resilient because they, they would die if it were up to me to care for them because they, I, just, I just don't have the ability to give the love and care and attention. It's, it requires consistency, right? You've got to pour yourself into uh, the, the, these, these things to keep them alive. Relationships are a lot like that. Relationships are often uh, interactions between us and another person that we have to devote time and, and attention to. There's some few relationships you probably have in your life where you can pick up after a few years and it seems like everything, nothing's changed, everything's fine. But more than anything, you probably have most of your relationships require you to have a great deal of investment. And when we don't invest in them, they tend to fall apart. Our relationship with the Lord can be like that. We can feel like if we don't put our, our time and attention into it, it's going to just fall apart. And, and, and there's a little bit of truth there. It, it, there requires some, some effort on our end to respond to what God's doing. But I want you to see that today we're going to be in John 15, and we're going to be talking about God the Father as the vine dresser. Jesus is the vine, and we are the branches. And I, one of the things I want you to see today is that it is not... We're not the one that cares for this plant that is our relationship with God. It is God, the Father, who's the one who stewards it. He's the one, he's the only one who can give it the time and attention and focus that it requires. He's the only one that can speak kindly to it. He's the only one that can give it the nourishment that it needs. So what I want you to do today is I want you to, to kind of enjoy the fact that we're talking about everyday grace. We're going to be talking today about grace in the details, and I want you to sit back and, and relax a bit, because I think we don't realize how much we need God's grace every single day. We are not uh, cacti, we are not succulents when it comes to God's grace. We are not minimal attention creatures, we are maximum attention creatures when it comes to God's grace. So I will give you a word of warning. Uh, today's sermon, if you're Baptist, you're used to a three-point sermon. Today is a four-point sermon. It's like seeing a unicorn in the wild. Just roll with it. I'm going to get to the third point, and you guys are going to be trained. Be like, oh, he's wrapping up soon. I'm not. we got one more to go, so just hang with me, all right? So we're going to start by talking about what is everyday grace, what is grace in the details, and then the three things that it brings to our lives. Uh, first, let's talk about everyday grace. Chapter 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Keep going to six. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. I'm going to be honest. I find this passage to be challenging. And I think one of the reasons why I find it challenging is the repetition that takes place of the ideas that are put forward. Uh, I, I think I'm a more linear thinker, and so Gospels like Luke and Mark hit me a little bit uh, easier. I think I get my head around them a little bit easier. So John uh, is, is recording Jesus' teaching, and either Jesus himself or John is recording it in such a way that it's an ancient Near Eastern teaching technique where you cycle through. You cycle through the, the concepts again and again and again, and each time you hit that concept, you're going to reveal more and more about it. So that's a little bit why it's repetitive. So what Jesus is saying here is that his father is the vine dresser. He's using an agricultural metaphor 
to describe a, a vineyard or a winery, something like that. And this is, this is the father is the, is the, the vine dresser. Jesus himself is the vine. He's the main plant. And then we who are believers in Christ are offshoots. We're branches as a part of this. And he talks about being pruned. He talks about being cast away, being tossed away and being burned. And, and this can be kind of scary imagery. Because anytime the gospels talk about burning, we all think about hell and we get concerned, we get worried. If you're spiritually sensitive, that, that kind of hits you a little bit. So what I would encourage you to do is I would encourage you to go back to our Hebrew sermon series that we did over the summer. One of the sermons uh, is called A Greater Security. And there we talk about the concept of apostasy and whether or not you can lose your salvation. It's on Hebrews 5 and 6. I would encourage you to listen to that. Because essentially a similar idea is saying here, those who do not remain in Christ are susceptible to walking away from the faith. But those who remain in Christ cannot walk away from the faith. So he's saying remain in him. And if you remain in him, you'll bear fruit. Now, what does it mean to remain in Christ? The Greek word is meno, meno, not meno, meno. And the word means to remain, it means to live, it means to dwell in something. So it makes sense why we call our daily scripture readings dwell. We want you to remain in Christ, we want you to spend time with him. We want you to inhabit uh, him. One of the ways that you do this, this is the primary way you do this, is by depending on him. We are called to depend on Christ fully. And Christ asks of us to depend on him, not just for the big things that come into our lives, but the small things as well. The minor problems, the things that you face every single day, getting to work. Monday through Friday, you think to yourself, man, I can do this, I can handle it. Can you? Can you do it in such a way that honors God? We have to depend on him for everything. This is why it says in verse five, I am the vine, you are the branches, whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. You can do nothing. It's not some things, it's not one thing. It's no thing, it's nothing. You cannot do anything apart from Christ. And this is hard for us. As human beings, we, are, we want to be self-reliant, we want to be independent. That's kind of the whole point of, of Adam and Eve eating the fruit in the Garden of Eden. They wanted to be independent of God. They realized they could be their own God, and we want to be that too. It's compounded by the fact that we're Americans. There's no higher thing that we praise, that we glorify in our country than independence, self-reliance. We love it. We turn it into an idol oftentimes. We want people, we want our kids to grow up to be self-reliant and independent. One of the best compliments you can give to a woman in our day and age is to be a strong, independent woman. There's nothing wrong with some of those things. But it is wrong the degree to which we love to be strong and independent. The way we lie to ourselves and say that we are independent. I saw a magazine cover require, re, re, received, it was a, maybe a few years ago, it received quite a bit of criticism. It had Kendall Jenner on the front, and she was labeled as the youngest self-made billionaire, which is just laughable. Not self-made. She comes from a very wealthy family. And so it received a lot of criticism. But that illusion, that narrative that we are self-reliant is so seductive. I hope you see the importance of everyday grace here. Because if you don't understand what I'm talking about right now, the rest of the sermon will make very little sense. The fact that Jesus does anything for us, the pruning, the nourishing, the growing, the feeding, the empowering us to accomplish things that are of any value at all. When we bring so little, nothing, to the relationship is a grace in and of itself. You see, a lot of us grew up in the Baptist church and we were taught morals from the Bible. You went to Sunday school and you said, be courageous like David, be faithful like Daniel, be patient like Job. The Bible is not a collection of moral tells to make you a better person. It is one grand story of our deep, deep need for a savior, apart from whom we can do nothing. It is not uh, Aesop's fables. You do not need Jesus 
to be a better person. You don't need Jesus to be nice. There's plenty of non-believers who are nice. You do not need Jesus to be moral. There are many people who are more moral than we are. You need Jesus for everything. Everything. And that's what it means to become a Christian. I don't know if somebody told you that. Maybe that was the bait and switch. Sorry for that. But when you confess, when you stand in the water of baptism and you profess that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, what you're saying is, apart from him, I can do nothing. I can't do anything. That's what people are going to be talking about. That's what they're saying when they come out of the water on September 24th at the outdoor baptism. We don't say Jesus is just my Savior. We say Jesus is my Lord. We say Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Yes, he saves you. Yes, he redeems you. But he also empowers you to live. And so we must remain in Christ. We must dwell in him. And out of this will, become, will come uh, things that are born out. So let's talk about what those might be. First, everyday grace brings growth. It brings growth. Look back at verse 6. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Our ears start to perk up a little bit here because it's nice to see that we're going to get something out of this. Anytime we're asked to do something because we're a results-oriented culture, we want to know what's going to, what's going to be the, the benefit of this. And so Jesus very compassionately tells us, we're going to bear fruit, we're going to grow. So what does this mean? Well, first let's talk about prayer because it's pretty amazing what he says about prayer. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it'll be done for you. You cannot abide in Jesus apart from prayer. If you're struggling to remain in him, struggling to abide in him, it may be that you're not praying. Prayer is an essential component. And look what it says here about prayer. It says that you ask for whatever you want and you get it. Now, Travis, some of you, perhaps very naively, are like, that sounds pretty cool. Tell me more. Those of you who are a little more jaded, you're like, that can't be right. You've got a translation that's weird. Are you using the King James, Travis? Jesus is not telling us that he becomes our genie when we abide in him. Jesus is nobody's genie. Nobody's. He serves us and he loves us, but he's not on our payroll. He doesn't work for us, not like that. So what does this mean? What he's saying is that when you remain in him, your heart begins to be transformed. You take on the characteristics of the vine. You're the branch and you're the vine. He doesn't derive his characteristics from you. You derive your characters from him. You derive your health from him. And so as you are remaining in him, dwelling in him, spending time with him, trusting in his everyday grace, your heart is transformed and your prayers become to look like his request. You see, Jesus cannot, yes, I intentionally using the word cannot, answer prayers that are outside of his will or his character. And what I mean by answer is he can't give you what you want if it's outside of his will or character. And so for those of us who are remaining in him, dwelling in him, God does answer our prayers. Now, does he answer them the way that we want? No, not always. But even that is for our benefit. How many of you had a teacher? I had teachers like this in math, because it was usually math that I wasn't getting. And you would look at your paper and you'd look at the board and you'd be like, I have a completely different answer. They're, they, they've somehow come up with something with a decimal. I have a negative number. Don't know how that happened. And I'm like, how did you, you know, what's the answer? And they'll be like, well, how did you get the answer you got? And I'm like, I don't need to know that. I just want the answer. Don't teach me. Just help me finish. I'm not going to be an engineer. It's okay. But a good teacher is not going to do that to you. A good teacher is going to help you think through the process so that you can solve the problem later. And God is a good teacher. He is not just going to give you what you want. I mean, he can give you something that you don't even know you need. Moses has this happen to him in Exodus 33. He tells God, he says, God, I want to see you. I want to see your face. And God's like, hey, you don't know what you're asking for, dude. That's going to kill you going to kill you. But what I will do is this. I'm going to put you in a little rock, in a little cubby, and I'm going to put my hand over it. And as I pass by, I'm going to remove my hand and you're going to see my back. And that's the best I can give you. 
And this happens to Moses. You know what happens to Moses after this? One, he and God sit down and rewrite the Ten Commandments because Moses broke them earlier. God reinitiates the Old Covenant with the people. And then Moses' face shines like glory for a while. Totally changes his ministry. Everybody in the the congregation, everybody in the nation of Israel knew that, man, Moses has seen something. God answered his request, but he answered it in his own way, in his own time. And when you remain in Jesus, one of the keys, one of the ways you know you're remaining in Jesus is no matter what answer you get, you find yourself to be satisfied with it. Not only do we pray, we also bear fruit. Look at verse 8. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. It's not just fruit, it's much fruit. Now what's fruit? Notice it's not fruits. It's fruit. Well, if you, again, have grown up in church for any length of time, you have memorized, probably with a song, Galatians. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. I think faithfulness is in there too. I always leave that one out, much to my fear and terror. But we're not in Galatians. This isn't Paul writing. This is John. What does John have to say about fruit? John uses fruit very widely. It can mean a lot of things in the Gospel of John, in his letters as well. It is anything of spiritual value. Sometimes he uses it as obedience. Sometimes he uses it as repentance. Sometimes it's confession. Sometimes it's evangelism. And then when you couple that with what we know about the rest of the Bible and the fruit of the Spirit that's, that's very clearly taught in Galatians, Guess what we come to? Fruit is anything of spiritual value, something that manifests itself. Are you bearing spiritual fruit? Is there anything of spiritual value coming out of you that is a benefit not just to you, but to the people around you? Because notice what it says in verse two. Let's get back up there. It says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So I had to read about agriculture this week and learn what this meant. Why do you prune something? Now, what I learned about vine dressing is that the time that they prune, when they cut away the branches, or some of the, some of the branches, is during, right when the, the, the fruit is first appearing. Now, the reason why they do this, I thought was really interesting. Uh, they do this because there are limited resources, nutrients and water, and so a plant will simultaneously try to grow fruit and grow new, vi- new branches at the same time. And so the vine dresser knows that I want the resources, the water, to go just to the fruit. I don't need the new, new, new branches right now. I need just the fruit. So I'm going to trim back the branches in this season of fruit bearing. They can grow branches at other times. But I want the nutrients to go to the fruit. And this is what God does for us. God trims back branches that are out of season in our life. So what's an out of season branch? It's not hard to find them. The things that God trims back are anything that impairs our spiritual growth. These can be good things that have kind of gotten out of control. They're bad things, maybe, that shouldn't be there in the first place. Maybe they're idols, which are usually good things that have just taken a a, a too prominent place in our life. There are things that are out of season, right? I love baseball. I love to watch baseball. But if the only thing I ever did was watch baseball, and there may be a good argument that maybe it's out of season in my life, But if I ignored my children, ignored my family, ignored my job just to watch baseball, that is an out of season branch in my life and it must be trimmed back. Sexual relationships are also uh, something that seems to get out of season very easily in our lives. Sex is intended for between a man and a woman in marriage. Anything outside of that is out of season. It's out of season and God trims it back. This is what spiritual growth is. This is what sanctification is. It's that pruning. It's that disorientation, reorientation, appointing that we talked about last week. Pruning is the disorientation piece. But because God desires us to grow, he prunes us back. And because God desires us to grow, we give him glory. Again, look what it says in verse 8. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. God gets glory from us bearing fruit fruit. And this doesn't just have to be on Sunday morning. This is why you need everyday grace. Because it's easy to fake fruit bearing on Sunday morning. It is a lot harder to fake it every other single moment of your life. But Jesus desires us to bear fruit when we're at home, when we're at work, when we're on the road, when we're in retirement. 
bearing fruit in all seasons. This is the fruit, and it glorifies God. Every day, common stuff requires you to rest in the grace of God. So everyday grace brings growth, but it also brings joy. Skip down to verse 11. We'll pick up 9 and 10 next. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Jesus is really gracious to us here. He tells us why. He's telling us stuff. God doesn't always give us a why, but here Jesus is. And he says we're going to have full joy. This idea of full joy is completed joy. It's the same word, complete, that you use to describe a, a uh, poem or a piece of music that somebody has completed, a work of art. And what God's telling us here is that we can have full joy, and not just full joy at some time in the future, and it's not full joy because we do something. We apparently have full joy because Jesus has told us something, and we now have full joy in this life. It's something you can experience today. And you sit there and you say, Travis, have you watched the news? Like ever. How do you have full joy? Do you even understand why I'm here in church today? I'm here because I don't have full joy. My life is a wreck and I am desperately in need of the gospel. I'm in need of something that you have to offer and you're sitting here telling me I can have full joy today. I'm not telling you that. Jesus is. You see, it's very difficult to have full joy in an imperfect place like earth. But if you look through the Gospels and you look at every time, not every time, but most of the time that the word joy is used, it is used to describe a person who is responding to something that God has done or God has told them, a revelation by God. So in Luke chapter 2, the angels tell the shepherds what? We bring you good news of great what? Joy. You are supposed to respond with joy. Luke 15. Jesus says that there is more joy in heaven over one sinner that repents. Joy in response to God doing something. In Matthew 13, in the parable, where there's a man who sells everything he has and buys a field, and the field, the treasure that he has in the field, that's the kingdom. It says in his joy he goes away and sells everything when he finds the treasure, when he finds the kingdom. Even in the one use of joy in the mark, Mark's not a happy book, in the one use of joy there, it's to describe the four soils, and it describes one of the soils that doesn't produce a long-term faith. And it says they initially receive the gospel with joy. Joy is a response to God doing something. Our joy doesn't come from our circumstances, whether they are good or bad. It comes from the announcement and proclamation that the gospel is real, that Jesus Christ has died for our sins, that he lived a perfect life, that he was raised to life again, and he will one day raise us, and we will live in a new heaven and a new earth where every sorrow and every bit of mourning you have ever had, every frustration will be awash in a sea of joy. That is how your joy can be complete, because that is a guaranteed promise. Every bit of suffering we have today is temporary. And I know that's sometimes hard to see and hard to trust. But when you remain in Him, when you depend on Him for His grace, you have to have everyday grace to have everyday joy. It's not something you can manifest on your own. So how is this something that we can kind of tap into? One, it's in service. Oftentimes, one of the best ways to get through your stuff is to help somebody else get through theirs. Our preschool ministry is booming. People keep having babies. Jeez. Which is wonderful. Love babies. But with the more babies, we're starting new classes for preschoolers, which again, praise God. But that means we need more people. And if I were not up here, that is exactly where I would be serving. I have a four-year-old. Most of you I would trust to teach my daughter about Jesus. Most of you. The rest of you probably can do like adult connect group. That's fine. That's not that hard. Will you serve? Will you find what God has called you to do? And will you serve? Finding satisfaction in serving other people is a great place to find joy, but we also find joy in the midst of what's called the dark night of the soul. We don't feel like God is close to us, and that sounds strange, but it's a place for us to trust Jesus when we can't feel him, when we can't hear him, when we can't see him. When it feels like Jesus is distant from us, we need that grace. We need that everyday grace 
to walk through those dark seasons and not lose our faith. You need grace both when you're most satisfied in God and when you are least satisfied in Him. And that is how you find joy, knowing that He is there. He's there. So every day grace brings growth. It also brings joy, but it also brings love, perhaps best of all. Verse 9, 10, and then skip down to 12. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. This is perhaps the best part, but it's also uh, the hardest part. Because it seems like, as I'm reading this, it seems like for me to uh, have God's love, it's conditional on me obeying him. Travis, I don't know if you understand what grace is, because that seems the complete opposite of grace. And it would be. It is. You see, God's love is not conditional, and I'll tell you why. John conveniently tells us in his first letter, so same author, different part of the Bible, he says God is love. And so because God is love, God's love cannot be conditional because there's no qualities of God, no characteristics that are conditional. God isn't holy except for on Wednesdays. He's always holy. God is not just except for when he feels like it. No, that's, that's not how he works. And therefore, he is not love with conditions. God is love. That's his character. That's who he is. So what is the conditional part of this, Travis? Well, for me to enjoy the love of God to feel it, to experience it. I have to remain in him. I have to trust in him. I have to rest in his everyday grace. I have to to dwell in him. Obedience is not how you earn God's love. That's what Jesus is telling us here in verse nine. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love. Jesus is not telling us to earn God's love by obedience. He's telling us respond to God's love by obedience. You experience his love by obedience. You enjoy his love by obedience. If you want to know how to give God a big old hug, obey him. Listen to him. God's love language is obedience. We listen to him. And this is how Jesus expressed his love for the Father. This is what he tells us in verse 10. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love love. Jesus was perfectly obedient from start to finish, but the supreme evidence of his obedience was going to the cross and dying for the sins of people who were God's enemies. And that's what we are. That's what we were. Before you come to Christ, you were born into a condition of warfare with your creator because Adam and Eve gave that to us to inherit from them when they ate from the fruit. And so when Jesus tells us in Matthew 5, love your enemies, he's not telling us this as a do what I say, I don't have to do this. No, Jesus is telling that to his enemies. He's telling it to people that he came to die for, to reconcile them to Christ, to bring them into the vine. We weren't just branches cast aside, we were invasive weeds, choking out God's good design. And God in his grace and mercy through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ transforms us into cut from kudzu, poison ivy, and poison oak into vines and branches that produce fruit and bring glory to his name. And this is why he tells us in verse 12, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. We must love. And you are only going to love those around you only going to love them if you are resting in his everyday grace, if you have grace in the details of your life. And the reason for this is you will, if you don't trust in his grace, you'll err on one side or the other, grace or truth. Who are my people? And please don't raise your hand. I know it'll be a temptation for these people because you like to be right. Uh, But who are my people who love to be right? It's okay. You don't have to raise your hand. But you will err on the side of truth. You're like, I'm just going to tell people the way it is. And I'm right. I know I'm right, so I'm going to tell them. But then there's those of us who are people pleasers, and we are on the side of grace. I just want people to love me, and I want God to help them figure it out, and he will. And then there are those of us who are cursed souls that want to be right and want people to love us. And we live a tortured existence, riddled with anxiety. To love people well, we must love in grace and truth. And you cannot love them unless you love them the way that Christ calls us to love, which is sacrificially. Because to love someone graciously 
when you want to be right is a sacrifice. And to love someone rightly when you want to be gracious is a sacrifice. And the only way that you can do that is by resting and remaining and dwelling in Christ's everyday grace. By being close to the vine, by being in the vine. Some of us have been cut off. Some of you are cut off. You've never been apart. You're still a weed. And God desperately desires you to transform your life into this beautiful branch that bears fruit. Will you trust him today? Will you say, Lord Jesus, I need that grace? And there's some of us also in this room who have forgotten that we are fruit-bearing plants. We have not been in season perhaps for a while, and it's because we keep trying to do things on our own. It's never too late. The vine dresser is always there, ready to prune you, of course, but to love you gently. We need his everyday grace, and it will bring growth, it will bring joy, and it will be love. And if you want any of those things, you must have his everyday grace. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you for the grace that you have given to us to dwell richly with you. Thank you for the way that you have taught us through a a metaphor, our relationship with you. I pray that we would trust in you, rest in you, and remain in you these days. It's in your son's name, amen. We're gonna have a time of response now. Uh, But as we respond, I'd like to read to you again a, a part of this passage. You can dwell on it, rest in it as we close. Verse 8, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love.